Let me back up. So uh, we're going to talk about real property and environmental law. Last class in Chapter 23, we kind of talked about the differences between real and personal property. Now we get in more de depth about or detail about real property. Uh, and that means we're going to talk about everything from fee simple, which we used that term last class, to uh, other ways you can get possession of property, like adverse possession, some of the limitations imposed on your right to own or possess property. We'll look at leases, and then we'll end with some uh, stuff about environmental law. So we did mention that real property is generally immovable and includes things like land, buildings, homes, but this slide gives you a little more detail about other things that it might cover, like the air below or the, the minerals above, or the air above and the minerals below, all right? Just seeing if you pay attention. So uh, if you ever get a deed to property, one thing you'd want to check is that you get it all, right? That you get um, not only the right to use the surface, but the subsurface or the air above it. That'd be a bummer. You could only use the surface and didn't get the air. How would you breathe? That'd be tough. Um, probably more common that you, I mean, that you grant rights to others to use the airspace or um, you grant the right for people to come on and take things from your property. Like what kind of things might they come take? Trains. Dirt, what? Water, Animal. gravel, animals. So we're going to talk about all the things you can take and what kind of rights those are. Plant life and vegetation, uh, minerals below the property, or fixtures, which we talked about that a little last time in terms of it being personal property, but per, uh, fixtures are personal property that get permanently affixed to the real property and basically become part of the real property. And what is the single most important factor from your reading of the chapter that the courts look at when determining whether something is a fixture or not? Well, I mean, certainly how permanently is it attached and, and how much effort it would take to remove it, how much damage would be. But it's one word. Just one word. Starts with an I. Yes, intent. It's also up there on the slide. So, um, what did the person mean when they put it there? Is it something that they um, put there but planned on moving later? Do you remember any recent examples of that? The dome, right? The detachable dome. And. Um, what other things would you say would be a fixture? Well, would a barn really be a fixture, or would a barn be real property from the beginning? Because a barn to me sounds like... But if you erect one... Yes, but you erect houses, you erect buildings, right? I mean, yeah, I... Mm, yeah, I mean, I, again, I think it depends... I know I uh, I canceled my Direct TV and I had one of those like big old giant. I mean I've had it that long. Like, I got called them and like um, I need to cancel. They're like, well you've been a customer for years. We don't want any of your stuff. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I suppose it could be mounted in a, a location in, in a way that it's not intended to remove. <coughs> well, I don't know if that's a fixture. I think it's one or the other. I think it's personal property when it's mobile, and I think it's real property if it gets attached. I mean, I think part of our confusion here is when we think of attached, we, well, technically we would attach everything that didn't naturally occur on real property. Like we, although I was about to say we don't attach trees, but I attached a couple trees. Right? I mean, I don't think those are fixtures. I think those are real property, yeah. Yeah, but that's you have to find the irrigation system. Right, so an irrigation system. By looking at it, you can probably tell whether the person intended for that to become permanent or not. Like a hose and a sprinkler, same thing with a pool. I mean, how easy would it be to remove? Sure. I mean, there are 
the uh, small kiddie pools, inflatable pools, but then you know, after a while it's intended to be more of a permanent solution. Chandeliers? I don't know. I guess part of it is when you go to buy a house, isn't there some question as to what goes with the house and what? So one thing you're going to want to do is be specific about what you get. So if it's so adapted to the property, it becomes part of the property. And uh, this is true in the commercial setting, too. Um, when I lived in Kalamazoo, they were building, Western Michigan University was building an industrial park near the highway. You guys probably, if you've been up and down 131, seen it. And um, they had these big pieces of equipment inside the building, so big you couldn't get them out. How'd they get there? They Yeah, they either built around it, they put it there, and then they built around it, or they figured out a way to bring it in, and put, or brought it in in pieces, right? So, haul it in before you put the ceiling on, bring it in in pieces. Then, But the point is that it would be really hard to remove. Um, often, uh, the law says you can take a trade fixture as long as you can remove it without causing any permanent damage. If you can fix it, you're usually good to take it. So remember fee simple from last time? Now we get to fee simple absolute. Fee simple absolute is the biggest bundle of rights you can have to real property. So those things we talked about last time, selling, giving it away, uh, gifting, yeah, that'd be the same thing as giving it away, uh, leasing it, trading. trading it for some others, good. So the easiest way to convey property from one party to another and give them everything is simply, and we'll just use A and B here, A to B. In other words, if you don't reserve anything, you give everything. So A, owning the property in fee simple, grants everything they have to B. And we've always got to have some new names. A is the grantor, the one making the grant. And B is the what? Grantee. Grantee, the one the grant is made to. And that transfer without any conditions or holding anything back is called fee simple absolute. But it's not always the case that you convey everything away. Instead of just saying from A to B, in the first bullet up there, notice it says A grants Black Acre, which has always been the fictional name of real property and real estate law, to B for B's life. How is A to B different than A to B for B's life? Right, there's something else that's going to happen. So A to B grants us to B basically forever. And if B dies, which B is going to cover that last class, I think, um, then what happens with B's interest? Well, no. A to B, and then no, no exceptions or conditions, and B dies, where does B's interest go? To B's heirs. But on this slide, we see A to B for the life of B makes you want to say, then what? Right? And then some of you um, looked at the last bullet there, and it says, the grantor A retains a future interest in the property. That means A isn't granting everything away. Now, A could. One way of granting a life estate is say, A to B for the life of B, then back to A. A to B for the life of B, then back to A. I want you to have this property while you're living, but after you d you're dead, I want it to come back to my estate. What if that person's dead? I said estate. I didn't say person. So this is what you need to start thinking of. It says life estate, and it mentions A and B as examples, but think of these as estates. A is estate, B is estate. So if B dies, the property go, goes back to A's estate. So if A's living, A gets to enjoy the remainder of the property. But if A is dead, then 
they don't, and then it passes where? A's, 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 A's errors, right? So typically in A to B, it passes to B's errors, but because there's a life estate and it reverts back to A to A's errors. I haven't complicated it yet. <laughs> in fee simple, does it just go to the heirs? Well, you could it it goes to your estate and you can do with what you want. Okay. Basically, that's the key difference. If you notice the metal bullet up there, in a life estate, B is just a caretaker. They only get to use it while they're living, and they're supposed to take care of it and not waste it for whoever's next. So if it's going back to A, A needs to get something back. Um, but if it's just A to B, B can do with it whatever they want. And it, that could mean if they die, it goes to the heirs, but it also could mean they could do what with it? Sell it, uh, D, or will it however they want. Rather than going to my heirs, I want it to go over to someone else. So not to throw a curve in it, but why not? A to B for the life of B, then to C. So the future interest doesn't revert back to A. Instead, it goes on to C. I like to call this the bad son-in-law grant. A to my precious B, I ate her husband, then to C. Right? So it's A's way of controlling what happens to the property for a while with one grant. So you, since you own the whole bundle of rights, you could convey what you want. Now, um, there are other grants that you could give. For example, yeah, question? Um, you said that it gives them the opportunity how far can they go with that? Could they say it goes to you and then it goes to you and then it goes to you and it's on and on and on and on? Well, um, there are some limitations in the examples I give. Like A to B for the life of B, then back to A. Then it goes into A's estate and whatever happens. I mean, the property continues forever and it goes somewhere. The question is just where. So I say A to B for the life of B, then to C. And then when C gets their interest, they can do with it whatever they they want. But could the grandmother then keep... Like, I suppose. Let's say you've got, like, uh, a bunch of kids. And you say, A to my eldest, then on to the next, and the next, and the next. Why is that so important? Because if you're an heir of one of these people, don't you want to know what you might get? So let's say your A's heirs, and A conveys a life estate to somebody else. What do you want to know? When they're going to die. When they're going to die and if the remainder is coming back to A's estate, if you're going to get something. Same thing with C. You know? C has an action against B if when C goes to get their interest, they got nothing. Right? A to B for life, B then to C. B dies, now it's C's turn. C's got B's basically diminish the value of the estate. Now your question might be, well, isn't B dead? What do they care? So it's an action against B's estate. So you could actually put a number of conditions on a grant. Like what if I said A to B as long as B uses it for charitable purposes, then back to A. You could be saying, here I want you to have this property as long as you use it for charitable reasons, but if you fail to, you sell it, you start using it in a way I didn't intend, I want it back. Yeah. I think I have a good example of that. Yeah? I know a girl, like, she was you know, considered B, the grantee. Okay. Her dad passed away. He owned a home. He gave it to her on the condition that she not get married. <laughs> and if she does get married, then it goes back to his estate. It has to be divided up amongst all the kids. Wow. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> but I guess it was to give her a place to live. She's a single mom. It was really more or less to give her a place to live. Huh. Based on the fact. Yeah. It's my sister's neighbor. She, yeah. huh. she doesn't date her. 
<laughs> Interesting. Yeah. But the mm. family's mad because they're all, I guess, would be considered C because if she did get married or fight, you know, it would go back to the... So they're trying to set her up? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> get married, get married, get married. What if she lives with someone in the house? I don't know the specific terms. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I'm only saying that because uh, you see how crazy this could get? I mean, all the conditions you can put. And the, the flip side of this is why do you care about this? Because if you go to get a deed, what kind of deed do you want? One that says A to B, right? Fee simple. I want everything. I don't want only for my life or I don't want to get something from B who only has a life estate, right? You want the whole deal. But sometimes that's the only way you get it conditioned. And I mentioned this one already that during B's life, uh, she can use it, possess it, take the fruits from it even, but not um, destroy the property or diminish its value because it's going on to C or it's going back to A. What if she does then that estate, who was supposed to get it, would have an action against her estate. You didn't give us what we were entitled to. All right, so those are what the book calls possessory interest. If you have them, you're entitled to stay there. These are non-possessory. You've got a right to use land, but it's not yours to stay on. Some examples include an easement and a profit. Have you heard of an easement before? So you can get to your property. Yeah, it might be you can't. It, it's by necessity. The only way you can get there is across someone else's property. Yeah. Or common driveway. Or utilities. Or boat launch or something, right? All those things. Beaches sometimes. So all those things are a right of someone else to come onto your land and use it for a specific purpose. We were talking uh, earlier about uh, cable. The last One of my hesitancies about going back to cable was the last cable experience I had wasn't that good. Uh, this is when I lived in Kalamazoo and I was, uh, what was it, charter, yes. And... One day I was leaving the neighborhood and I saw this um, pickup trump come pulling into the neighborhood with a backhoe. And I thought to myself, I feel sorry for the person who's going to have their yard dug up by that thing. You ever seen those machines that put a little slit in your land and then they lay the cable and then just bury it nice and... So I came back, it was my house. <laughs> and so I um, called them. I mean, they tore up my lawn, which wasn't really, at that point, wasn't in that great a shape anyway, but um, I called them, and I said, uh, this is what I found when I got home, and they said, well, sir, you don't understand easements. And I said, well, <laughs> okay, enlighten me, <laughs> right, yeah, so uh, tell me. And so they said, well, we have a right to come on your property, use it to dig up, maintain, blah, blah. And I said, well, yes, you have a right to use this many feet of the front of my home for this particular purpose. You, when you talk about maintain, that doesn't mean tear up and leave. They said, oh, well, that's, that's true. But the bad news is we contracted this out to someone else. They did it. Well, what do you know about um, duties that you might delegate under a contract? Somebody's life. And who is it? The Charter, right? I said, I, you know what? I don't care who you contracted with. I have a contract with you. I granted you the easement, so you are responsible for maintaining it. So um, they said, well, we'll get a hold of them, get them back over there and fix it. So I hung up the phone, and I knew where they were at, so I drove over there. And I came up, the guy's on the phone. He's like, yeah, yeah, uh yeah, he's right here. So <laughs> he got off the phone, and I said, hey, come and follow me. I'll take you back there. So I took him back and showed him what to do. You ever seen those, like they're like these beat-up old pickup trucks don't even look like they're from the cable company, and they have like a sign slapped on them? I call them yahoos and pickup trucks, right? They're just driving around, tearing things up, and getting paid for it. It's kind of a fun job, I think. Although 
laying cable in the winter time. I don't think that would be very fun. Anyway, so uh, they kind of filled in the hole, and I actually got a, a pretty much new lawn out of it, so it worked out pretty good. But they didn't have a right to camp there, take over, or exceed the scope of the easement. I had another easement beside my house. We had the biggest lot in the whole subdivision. Not because I have any money, but because the lot I bought had all the utilities and everything running into the subdivision on our lot. So we had extra wide lot for this to come in. Well, people heard that there was an easement there. So what do you think they did? They walk across, they play baseball on it, you know, whatever, thinking it was not anybody's property. It was our property. So after I shot at them a few times, they quit <laughs> with that. But again, the idea is that if it was somebody coming in to run a pipe underground, they could do that. But short of that, that wasn't what it was for. A prophet is the right to come onto land and take something from it. Trees, oil, gravel, water. And um, these two rights are non-possessory, but they also go with the property. <coughs> so if you buy property, you're getting it subject to easements and profits. If you ever looked at a deed, often it says easements of record, which ought to make you wonder, what does the record say? I mean, it's pretty common that um, land will have a utility easement on it. But what other kind of easements might be on the property? Like your neighbor might have an easement over your property or something like that. Yeah. We lived on the other side of the map it was actually what's the other side? side? If you're right downtown, what's the other side? <coughs> Southeast. Yes. It was Caledonia. No. We were in, still in Grand Rapids. <laughs> okay. But there was a house that they owned a wider lot, and they, someone had constructed a path from, and it went one street to the next, so people would take that path through the park. It was right in their property. So... Question is, is it an easement? I don't know. Sometimes they people put... complained about it. Either. Right. The kid was really convenient for the kids to run the wall. They run the block. They just cut down this little path. Yeah. Right yeah, and, and there's a slide coming up here that talks about different ways you can get an easement. One is to get a grant, you know, in a deed that says there's an easement here. There's a path. Another way could be by adverse possession. You know, people people claim that on uh, like lake shores, you know, on beaches and paths and boat launches and things like that. No one ever said they could do it, but they kept doing it, kept doing it, long enough. Like my family's got landlocked property, right? Right to get to them, so you can get an easement for or a helicopter. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> somehow you got to get you out or jump really far. I suppose. Well, in some places you can't get helicopter pay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't people have their own personal aircrafts? That's what I want to know. Like, I got to see these things like uh, these, these new these jet packs and new small personal airplanes coming out. Why? I mean, that would be awesome. <laughs> so you can hover. You just can't land. So, yeah, you drop out, repel out. You're good to go. I don't know. I don't get it. I think we should all be flying all over. <coughs> then we'd have texting and flying. Uh, I mean, one of the unsafe things I see is students texting and walking. It's so dangerous. You know, they have a new app out where you can watch where you're going while you text. Yeah, it uses your camera. Of course, I'm thinking you got to walk like this. <laughs> and you're looking and you're watching the video, yeah, it's kind of weird. But anyway, that's a little what off of easements and profits. Um, yeah, here's a slide. So you can get it through a deed. Could be in a will. I have this property. It goes to you. It comes with any easements. It could be by implication. You know, you you split up property, 
or necessity, you can't get out of it. It's landlocked. Or prescription or adverse possession. And you could get rid of it, although it's not that easy. Like I know quite a few subdivisions that say, we plan on having a park here. Or we plan on having this boat launch or whatever. And there's somebody's garden or house or something there because no one's used it in years. Definitely the idea is if you ever buy property to make sure there's nobody coming on it to use it for something like this. You know, it says by deed back to the owner of the land or um, you become the owner. You have property. You split it up. You give someone else the right to come on your property to get out of it. Then you buy the property back or you get the property back. You don't need the easement anymore. So it goes away. A license is different. While easements and profits go with the land, they're more or less permanent, licenses are temporary and revocable. Anybody been hunting? Yeah, so that is a revocable license, right? You get to go on some property, probably not yours, for a specific person. Hunt animals, not people. Um... I like to do this. I go to the movie theater and I, they say, tickets please. And I say, do you mean my revocable license? They really are impressed by that. I mean, basically that's what it is. A little slip of paper says, come on in. You can see this show, this limited purpose. If you do these things, we'll throw you out. I got thrown out last week. The movie said at the start of the movie, Something about take noisy children to the lobby. So I kept hauling kids out and they threw me out. But you get the idea. I mean, there's things you could do there and then they'd say, we don't want you there. Like jump to different movies. Here's a list of ways that you could transfer ownership in property. We've mentioned a deed already. You could gift it, sell it. Inherit it from somebody else, get it through adverse possession, and, and that there's a slide coming up on that. In eminent domain, that's a new one. What is that? Anybody remember that? When the government takes it, and they have to have certain um, criteria that they have to meet in order to constitutionally take it. Let's start with the first one, a deed. A deed is a writing that evidences a conveyance from the grantor for the grantee uh, with a legally sufficient description in it, not from this rock over to those trees, but, you know, in terms that would identify the land from any other land on the face of the earth. With the grantor signature, who is the grantor? The one making the grant, right? They, you need their signature on it. And then, like other things we've talked about, you also need delivery. It's not enough to write it up, sign it, and throw it in a drawer. You actually have to deliver the deed to convey the property. In case you see that in the future, all of the above. And these are uh, a couple different types of deeds. Some of these deeds are pretty simple. Some of them are more complex which means some of them are pretty cheap to get done. Others, well, obviously, done dirt cheap. Others are pretty expensive. No ACDC fans out there? Yeah. Right. Awesome. <laughs> Wasn't that good. It was weak. All right. My very first eight track. All right. So... Uh, think back to uh, warranties. What chapter was that? 13, yes. So, um, <laughs> you guys, you have to start looking at this stuff. If you're not going through that review sheet, make sure you start going through it. So, um, this is warranting. Did you guys hear a whistle? <laughs> okay. Um, this is warranting that you and everybody before you had good title to give to you. So you're saying, I got good title, and I'm giving you good title. 
That's what you want from someone. And if they didn't give you a good title, either because they didn't have it or somebody before them, they're going to make it right. A special warranty deed isn't as special. It sounds like it's extra special, doesn't it? A special warranty means that a special type of warranty that just says, when I had it, I didn't do anything to interfere with title, and you've got good title from me, but I don't know about the rest of those yahoos. So which do you want, a warranty deed or a special warranty deed? Warranty deed, right? And then uh, there's another one, implied warranty in new homes, which if you have the 8th edition, the textbook's not in there. That's why they charge you more. They added that to this edition. The implied warranties in new homes, kind of like the implied warranty merchantability, right? That it will be good for what it's good for, living in. Then there's quick claim deeds, not a warranty. You don't want this one unless it's a special situation because this, this is somebody saying, I convey this property to you. I don't warrant it at all. I give you whatever title I have, and that might be nothing. It would be like me saying, here, you can have my interest in this building. I don't have any. So you're not, if you're buying property, you're paying full price for it. You don't want somebody conveying to you whatever they have, and they may not have anything. Oh, that's a pretty good example. Thank you. Um, like, say, I own some property myself, and I get married. Marriage. I'm sorry, I was watching Princess Bride over the weekend. Because that's what I do, now that I have Comcast. Um, well, <laughs> that doesn't work. Hey, if it had cut out during Princess Bride, whoa, I would have found out where they were located and went there. Somebody's going down for that. All right, so uh, what was I saying? Something about Princess Bride? Oh, no, I'm getting married. And I own property by myself. And I want to put my wife's name on the deed. So I convey it from myself to myself and her. So it wasn't a transaction for money. And I'm one of the parties I'm conveying it to. So not a biggie. So I might do it for something like that. But... Other than that, yeah, this is not some, if you're buying property from somebody else, this is not what you want. You want warranties. Then these other deeds are all about getting property that someone else maybe had to give up. So, um, for example, you might buy property through a foreclosure, through a sheriff's sale, something like that. Uh, one thing to be careful of is what's called a period of redemption. A uh, period of redemption is the time that the original owner might be able to pay up and get the property back. So even after you buy it, whoever owned it before might be able to come up with the money and get back the property. Knowing that, you don't want to invest a lot of money or time into something until this period of redemption has passed. Recording statutes... Don't worry too much about this. Uh, here's what I will say. Somebody gives you a deed. No one else knows about it. A recording statute is all about putting the deed in the public record so everyone else will know you have good title to the property. In Michigan, we use the Register of Deeds office. That's what they do. They take deeds, record them. Somebody comes and looks it up. Georgetown Township, you can look up who owns what. So if you want to find out information about me, you can go out on their website and get a satellite view of my house and all kinds of stuff. That's how they found out I had a pool. All right. Uh, and, you know, the bottom one, sometimes it's a question of who gets to record a deed first, but that's beyond what we'll be talking about. Uh, you could get it the real property through a will or without a will. And basically, you can inherit it. If somebody dies with a will, it's called testate. If they, call, if they die without a will, it's called intestate, which is not the best. Intestate means the government decides what you would have, how you would have want your property split up. 
That doesn't sound like a good idea, does it? It's up. Why don't you figure it out, put it in writing before you die, versus letting your government assume how you wanted it to go. But either way, someone might get property through a, a will or through intestate succession, they call it. Uh, how does that work with um, like teens that die? Or like young, young people that die like in car accidents or something? You mean with their property? Yeah. Teens that own real property? Well, say a teen owns their own car. They paid for it with their life savings. Oh, yeah. I mean, right now we're talking about ways you get ownership over real property. We're not talking about teens and personal property. So say, what if he's an heir? Okay. Uh, what if, what if uh, somebody in their early twenties owns a piece? So of like land? you being in your yes. early twenties, yes. yes. <laughs> I own my own land, and yes, um, I die. I don't have a will. What happens to it? The government says. No, usually <laughs> not. I mean, and basically what I'm getting at is in intestate succession laws, which is easy to say, so there, there are a set of rules that basically say, you know, if you're married, it goes to your spouse. If your spouse, you know, the next, next, you know, just, okay. I guess the way we generally think things should go if no one has said how they should go. And usually your age doesn't matter too much. All right, adverse possession. We mentioned it before. We I think I called it squatters, right? Last class, I remember. Uh, there's a statute in every state, and it differs by the type of adverse possession in the state that says if you hold property that doesn't belong to you, we're talking about real property, long enough, it might become yours. So um, when I bought my property, the reason I bought it was because there was only one landowner behind the whole subdivision it was all woods and there was no way to develop the woods so we had wooded lots and um, when I first moved in there I was the first house in there and I said to the guy would you mind if I cleared some of this out because it was a old horse ranch there's barbed wire fencing and all kinds of stuff he said, no, don't go ahead, clear whatever you want out, except don't cut down my trees. So I proceeded to clear everything out but the trees, barbed wire and everything, and plant grass. So now my lot goes back pretty far. Well, after a few years, I thought, eh, I just put up a little fence. Right? So he comes along one day, and he sees the fence there, and he said, you know, that's not the property line. I said, oh, yeah, I know. I mean, we've talked. I know that's not the property line. He says, well, I think I want you to take it down. I said, why? Well, I mean, you and I might know that, but if it stays there, then somebody might be under the impression that that's where the line is. And what if you try to claim that it's your land? Well, I mean, objectively, me having handled these type of disputes, it made sense to me. I mean, even though I knew what my intent was, I also knew that it's possible that somebody might mow, plant grass, put up a fence, and act like property that's not theirs is theirs, and do it long enough. I had a client in Sparta uh, who had a neighbor who was prone to fits of violence. That comes into play later. But um, he went to sell his property, and he discovered the neighbor's fence was on his property. And so I said, did you talk to him? He said, I'm not talking to that guy. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'll send him a letter. My letter didn't say, we're going to sue you out of existence. It said, gee golly, it looks like a result of survey uncovered this. We didn't know. You didn't know. We need to sell the property. What can we do? Not, not like, get your fence off our property. We even offered to sell him the strip. And uh, he responded with a lawsuit. <laughs> so we went to court, and he was trying to establish adverse possession. He'd lived there for a few years, but not long enough for the statute. But he tried to argue tacking, which means tack on your ownership to whoever lived there before. 
his argument was between the people he bought the property from and him, it had been there long enough that he now owned that. He'd been mowing it, maintaining it for years. As the lawsuit went on, my client was out mowing his yard on his side of the fence, and the neighbor shot at him. Said he was too close to his fence. <laughs> so we let that slip out during the trial, and my client won. But um, basically the problem was under the statute that he certainly had maintained it. He didn't put the fence up. The previous owner did put the fence up, but not the whole time the previous owner had lived there. Previous owner had only recently put the fence up and then sold it to this guy. So in that case, it was, I think, 15 years had to be, and it was not long enough. So we did win that case. But basically the argument is someone else maintains it. Uh, you can see that they're maintaining it, and they do it long enough adverse to your interest that it becomes theirs. They actually could get the court to have a deed entered into the record showing them to be the new owners of the property. So you could get property that way. Or the government could get it. Like M6, right? M6 wasn't there. Everybody wanted a, a quick way to get down to the southeast side of Grand Rapids. And uh, it certainly has helped to have it there. But there were a lot of farmers and people who weren't too happy about M6 coming through there. And so, as the second bullet says, the government did a taking under the Fifth Amendment. It took private property for a public use, in this case a highway, which sometimes that can be the issue, is is it really a, a public use? Like the people who comprise the government are often people who would benefit from whatever the use might be. And then just compensation, that's often a debate too. Like what farmers or whatever think their property is worth versus what the government thinks it's worth is often different. Yeah? And they have to like pay double or something like that. Well, no. There, I mean, there might be some statutes that address in some situation a requirement they pay twice some determined value, but generally just compensation means what's fair. Now, the, the, the government might in some situations have a policy of that, like to avoid any debate about how much it's worth, pay twice what they think it's worth. Someone else might say it's still worth much more than double the value. Remember that up on uh, Knapp's Corner? Remember the house that sat <coughs> like up on a cliff for years? Right? It was some guy who he refused to move. Yeah. Like yeah, it was all dug up. No, if that if that does happen, say they want to make a highway, right? And this person sells, and this person sells, but this person doesn't want to. Then they can have a hearing. Okay, and then the court could say you have to sell. Yes. So they could say because the government has a right under the Constitution to take private. Pro I mean, they could say. Hey, you know what? I mean, the theory is this, that it all came from the government, and they could get it back if they wanted to. And while you got it, they can tax you for it. Yeah. Our house on Leonard left in the mm. They took our house. They, they took it? Where did they take it to? They actually tore it down. Oh. After we left it. Leonard, like Cornerstone? Leonard and Leffingwell. Yeah. Were, yeah. Cornerstone was across the street. And then yeah. Three houses they took off. Okay. And there's nothing like they didn't build anything. Oh. So it's by the. Uh, they, they, couldn't, they transferred it to industrial. Ah. And the first two hearings, the city actually voted again, voted no. Uh -huh. And the guy who wanted it kept coming back. That's weird, because isn't there a bunch of homes still there? Yeah. They only <laughs> took the three. Just one of yours, huh? I mean, there's Red Hot on the corner, Which down the other see? corner. Right. We were kitty corner. Yeah. We had a house with the pear tree. And the oh, tree. okay. Yeah. I know all that property pretty well. Yeah. And they were really crafty about it because the last time they served notice of the hearing, they sent postcards that 
Didn't get their total done. Oh. So they thought that was notice, huh? They did pay us above market value for that. Oh. All right, <laughs> leasehold estates. Anybody lease, rent? Now you can impress your friends by saying you have an estate, right? A leasehold estate. So uh, in, this isn't new either. We were talking about how insurance policies are contract law. There's a lot of contract law in leasehold estates. Um, the one who owns the property is called the lessor, and the tenant is called the lessee, and the contract is called the lease. It creates a leasehold estate. I keep saying that because a lot of people think, well, you really, it's more like a license, like you can come and go, but it belongs to someone else. No, while you have a leasehold estate, you have an interest in the property to the exclusion of others, including the owner, unless, you know, subject to some exceptions, they have to come onto the property. It always reminds me of the movie Duplex. I wonder if anybody ever see that movie? Right, yeah, where in the movie they think, well, since they own the place upstairs, they'll just go in and take whenever they want and tear the pipes out of the wall and stuff like that. But that's not the way it's supposed to work. Sometimes movies aren't real. Sometimes. <laughs> I was having this conversation with my uh, kid. I don't know. He's like, Dad, I saw this car on TV that had machine guns on it. And I'm like, well, son, it's real. Right. <laughs> Have you had one of those before? All right. Um, tenancies. This is, there's a little trick on this slide. You're going to see it. Don't let it get you. The second bullet says a periodic tenancy does not specify how long the lease lasts, which is weird because periodic seems like it would be for a set period, right? But no, the only thing periodic is that you pay, right? If it's so, if you had a lease that was a year, period, that's not a periodic tenancy. If you look up on the slide, what kind of tenancy is it? Tenancy for years. So don't fall for that. Don't fall for that. Yes. So what's the difference between a periodic tenancy and a tenancy at will? Ah, so a tenancy at will is you're there, they let you be there. You pay, they take your money. doesn't have to be any other type of tenancy. So in some cases, a tenancy for years turns into a tenancy at will. Uh, cases where, you know, not every tenancy is in writing. You know, sometimes people just have an arrangement where they make payments and they get to stay there. Sometimes they don't make payments. I've had people get in trouble for that. Like they try to throw someone out of their house because they're letting them stay there. And I'm like, well, they're not paying rent. It's my place. Be careful. You need to evict them properly. Question or? What's an example of a periodic tenancy? So a periodic tenancy, let's say you have a rental agreement that isn't for a set period of time. It's only making payments on some interval, month to month. month. So month to month lease is a period. If you don't have any specific period <laughs> or there's, time that it's limited to. There's some. Uh, when I lived over in Holland, I had a um, a lease for two years, mm -hmm. and then after that, it went month to month. Right. Yeah, some of them will work that way. Others, like I was, I was renting some townhouses before, just one actually, before while we were building our house, and it said at the end of your six month period you're out unless you renew your lease. So it might be either one. And then tenancy at sufferance is the opposite of tenancy at will. You don't have any right to be there, and they don't want you there. Wrongful possession. Get out. Yeah. Although, sometimes, some people have gotten rights to places by squatting long enough and a tendency of sufferance. Like in Chicago, they actually turned over some buildings to homeless people who were living in them. Because, I mean, they basically took them over and lived in them for years and then said, 
They're yours. Doesn't that take like 10 years, though, to do? It depends on the statute. I don't know what it is in Chicago. Or Illinois. I like to say Illinois with an S at the end of All right, so um, there's a lease agreement, might be oral, often written, giving someone the right for use, exclusive possession of the property, governed by everything from contract law, common law, state and local statute, even some federal law. So um, if you're in the business of renting out to people, something to be concerned about. There's a lot of law governing this area. Um, in fact, I would say in a lot of cases, landlord-tenant law seems to be preferential to, to tenants. Landlords have to do everything right. Tenants can sometimes get away with things. Uh, tenants have a right to possess and use the premises. Main, they need to maintain certain part of the premises. Um, and they have an obligation to pay rent. The landlord has to deliver actual possession. It's not enough just to put a lease together and saying you have a right to use apartment 1A. They actually have to give up control to the tenant. The tenant has a, a right to quietly enjoy, which doesn't mean like it has to be absolutely quiet. It just means like they shouldn't be constructively evicted by really loud noises. There's a good way to evict and a bad way. A good way is to follow the legal process to evict somebody. If you have any question about what rights they have, to make sure they get notice and you follow the proper process. A bad way is to lock them out, take all their stuff, or, or throw all your stuff. Yeah, it, it might be the case. Uh, there's also constructive eviction. You didn't actually throw them out or lock them out, but might as well have because there's no heat or something like that. So you can stay there, but it's just not very comfortable. People do that. I've had people come to me and say, well, it's my place. I can do what I want. I shut off the heat. It's not a good idea. <laughs> Frozen people, not good. All right, the implied warranty of habitability, like the implied warranty of merchantability, but to leasehold estates, that if you are in the business of being a landlord, then your premises should be habitable. People should be able to habitate in them. You're responsible for maintaining common areas. In a commercial setting, maybe the tenant has some responsibility to maintain the premises. So you could have an action for breach of the implied warranty of habitability. Uh, there's no heat. I'm going to file a lawsuit and claim there's no cable. No, because I'm the owner. Never mind. So one of the or some of the questions that come up is who caused the damage? What kind of place are we talking about here? Is it really, really old? Is it brand new? And then rent, is that consideration under the contract? I'm not going to go through all these provisions, just kind of generally talk about some of the laws that are related to it. There are some laws related to what landlords have to do with your security deposit, letting you know where it's at, getting it back to you. Um, one question that does come up is, uh, what if you're a tenant and the landlord sells the property? Well, now you have new landlords. Right? You don't lose your tenancy because there's been a sale. Another question that comes up is, can you as the tenant convey any part of your leasehold estate? The answer is, well, the law permits you to do that. Sometimes in the contract they might have you agree to something different. I mean, if, if you're a... Here's two ways you can do that, either through an assignment or a sublease. Assignment, basically, you take over my lease. Sublease, you, you take a part of it over. 
Well, if you're a landlord, you do a lot of checking in and making sure whoever you rent to is who you want renting. So if they can just turn around and easily sublease to someone else, this could be a problem. So at least what I see in um, leases, pretty common, is you need the, the landlord's permission before you can sublease or transfer an interest. All right, environmental law. More exciting even than landlord-tenant law is environmental law. A lot of emphasis on that lately, I think. You know, um, everything from global warming to oil spills to you name it, it's been going on. Even locally, I think there was a big spill in the Kalamazoo River not too long ago. Uh, so, just like landlord-tenant law, there's a lot of different law that regulates in this area from contract law, common law, um, state and local regulation, even at, at a federal level. Most of these slides talk uh, about at the federal level, level, like the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. But um, a nuisance. Nuisance might be a little different than what you think. You might be thinking of me, but what this means is it's kind of a legal definition given to someone interferes with your ability to enjoy your property in a kind of annoying way. I don't know, maybe a pig smell. Um, somebody help me out here. So Pollution. Somebody puts a light. Light. <laughs> like a yeah, this, this is... Um, there was a case about that where um, there's these two f neighbors that start feuding. And the one neighbor puts up these series of spotlights <laughs> that are on the motion detection system. And basically, whenever they move on their property, these lights go on them. On these, like, 100-foot poles that are down. And so the other neighbor annoyed by this, puts up surveillance cameras on their property <laughs> that broadcast on a frequency that everybody in the neighborhood can pick up on. And then so the other, you know, but anyway, it ends up in a lawsuit, and I think the judge was tired of both of them. But, uh, yeah, yeah, spotlights could be, could be a severe nuisance, especially when they're trained right on someone's house. Bedroom window. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Was that movie with Samuel Jackson? Lakeview Terrace. He was the cop. Yeah, Lakeview Terrace. He is a crazy guy. <laughs> he plays a good crazy. Lakeview Terrace. Yes. Yeah. I saw it because it was PG 13. <laughs> I can only see PG 13 movies. Let my kids see it. Now they're afraid of the neighbors. <laughs> Why? Well, just because they yeah. make sense. Um, <laughs> has a in her Stop. Say no more, mother-in-law. <laughs> okay. Um, behind her fence is a tree that the people get on their own. But the tree overhangs yes. across her pool. Yeah. So she went to them and said, I need to, mm -hmm. I'll pay for it to be trimmed. Right. And when the tree guy came out, they had three different tree people come out because there was a dispute over how far to cut the tree back. All three of them said, we cut it back to where it's just not um, over the pool anymore. Pool it's going to do something to the tree. Yeah. We have to go back to the right. actual trunk. So it's tree or pool? Yeah. And the neighbors were just living. They were, no, you can't. Do right. It's our tree. Don't kill our tree. But she wasn't trying to kill the tree. She wanted to take it back to the She's like, I don't want to kill it. Tree killer. Kill Your mother-in-law is a tree killer. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Yeah, they're tree killers. <laughs> no, because she took it back so that it wouldn't injure the tree. Yeah. She actually, of course, they were the neighbors refused to allow the tree guy onto his property, onto their property. To do it. So, so yeah, the tree. So a little airspace interference there. They got to trim the part of the tree that was in their airspace. Yeah, it was a. Wow. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, some of the worst, most violent disputes are over stuff like that. Neighbors. Ugh. Hmm. All right. Negligence is strict liability. In, you know, basically in a business setting, you owe a duty to people you invite on your property. 
So if they're a business invitee, you should warn them if there's some dangerous activity. You know, caution wet floor sign or something like that. Or just watch them slip. It's always a good time. Yeah. Um, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, is responsible for policing a number of the acts that I'm going to put up here. There's their site, epa.gov. And uh, really, a number of um, decisions that businesses and the government make have been influenced by what environmental impact they're going to have. In fact, this slide talks about the National Environmental Policy Act and mentions an environmental impact statement. If a somebody undertakes some major federal action, they need to disclose these things, which are on the next slide here. What impact that action will have on the environment if it's adverse and if it's irreversible. You don't have to do that when you plant a garden, but the federal government does when they undertake some major undertaking, which um, could be a lot of different things. I was mentioning to my last class, in the military, whenever the military refuels, moves, or whatever, they usually need to let people know and disclose what impact their actions will have on the environment. I remember my arch nemesis was the Kirtland Warbler. Anybody know what the Kirtland Warbler is? All protected species. You couldn't go anywhere around them. Couldn't disturb them, you know, because they were mating and everything. Anyway. The Clean Air Act has to do with clean air. That's why I'm recording this class. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Uh, both from stationary and mobile sources of pollution, things like factories to cars, uh, you need to control your pollution using MACT. If you're doing the exam review, this could be helpful to you. The Maximum Achievable Control Technology. That's what the Clean Air Act says you have to use to try to control what you put into the air. Now, if you think about it, as we get into these, doesn't it make sense the federal government would regulate air pollution? If you think about it at a local level, they could too, but doesn't air travel past state boundaries? It would be good. Cars do, certainly. Factories are more or less stationary, but their pollution travels. Last part of the paragraph there. I'll leave it up for a minute. Oh, I see. Yep. So basically use the best you have to make sure, not just like, eh, we made an attempt. What number is it? 90 or 9 or 0. All right, Clean Water Act has to do with clean water. Awesome, see. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> no, it's a trick. Um, yes, Clean Water Act has to do with clean water. Not all water, but most. Like what you swim in, what you drink, anything you navigate in. So pretty much the only thing. That, I mean, even wetlands. Like the townhouses that I stayed in were on wetlands. That was kind of weird. The townhouse, the um, I think they're trying to sell them now. Up behind uh, Rivertown Crossing Mall. Anybody knows where those are at? Like that whole thing was a swamp. And they put these townhouses in there. And then like all around it are signs that say, protected wetlands, protected wetlands. So you, you can't do it. You can't put anything in there because... If you put anything in there, then it leaks into, it seeps into the wetlands. It's weird. Somebody told me that's why the parking lot's all like uh -huh. up and down because like all those. Oh, you mean that Rivertown Crossing yeah. Mall? Yeah. It's kind of funny. 
Yeah, that is weird. You know what we're talking about? Rivertown Crossing Mall, the parking lot. Well, they have those <laughs> Sounds like there's speed bumps. Like, no, I, thought, I thought there was speed bumps. No, there's no way. <laughs> hey, I can take those things fast, man. It's fun. <laughs> I remember that mall was first built. It was flat. Yeah. I swear. It was. I remember those days when there was only 44th Street and they built all that up. <laughs> all right. Water pollution. There's a number of other acts related to water from Safe Drinking Water Act to what you dump in the ocean. I'm not going to ask you about ocean dumping. Just so it's bad. That's right. <laughs> we don't deep six things. Same thing same thing with uh, oil pollution. That's bad too. A lot of that going around lately, right? Uh, even toxic chemicals. Actually these guys what are they it looks like they're cleaning up booms from an oil spill or something, but some type of toxic substance here. Uh, everything from insecticide, fungicide, and rodenticide um, to where you uh, store and dispose of toxic chemicals, how much you can hold, what kind of labeling you have to put on it, or if it's even prohibited altogether. There's lots of stuff sitting in the sheds of people's houses that used to be okay to use, no longer okay to use. Um, and then disposing of it. So there's rules relate, related to where and how you can dispose of hazardous waste. I always think of Hastings, my, my hometown, because it's at the intersection of M37 and M43. And right at that intersection, there's a gas station. Well, I don't know what it is now. But no one ever wants to do anything with it because it's leaped all kinds of fuel into the ground. And um, at some point, some sites have um, become hazardous waste sites that need to be cleaned up. And in the old days, they used to try to figure out who put it there, find them, sue them, recover the money, and then clean it up. Well, that didn't work in some cases. Some cases, they're bankrupt, they're gone can't figure out who did it, whatever. So there are a whole lot of uh, laws related to what it takes to be declared a Superfund site. But once you are, the government comes in and cleans it up and then goes looking for perps. That's what I like to call them. At the bottom there, underlined, potentially responsible parties in case you were thinking it was something else. Basically, um, if you're somebody who transported hazardous waste somewhere, you're the person who's responsible for putting it there, or you're the one who's holding it, you could be responsible. Jointly and severally. That means one of you, some of you, or all of you might have to pay. Well, if you think about that, this is important. What number is it? 47. 47. Um, let's say you have a site and it's discovered to be contaminated and they try to figure out who put it there. They can't find out who transported it there. They can't find anybody who was there when it was put there and you're the only one. That means they can come after you for all of it even though you didn't put it there. So what would be good for you to do before you buy property? Get an attorney. Yes. I always get an attorney. That's what I say. Um, but, yeah, have it che checked. Have it tested. So even if um, you were transporting fuel to a gas station and the, the tanks for the gas station had a leak, you could be responsible for it? Uh, I don't know. I don't know uh, how many cases are about that. Okay. Uh, because you just said... Um, I did just say that. Just in that particular incidence, I mean, I'm envisioning like barrels of hazardous waste that you bring there and therefore you, you bought them there, you should be responsible. But 
you could make the argument that we shouldn't be responsible because we did nothing negligent and it was their fuel tanks that were leaky. But I, I don't know how those cases come out. A yeah. lot of those sites are old dumps, right? Where, where people could intentionally take or stuff to, or, right? or it could be places where they were storing stuff on site. Um, like, I probably shouldn't record this part, but you know, the MTAC on Godfrey is on a Superfund site. Yeah, I mean, all of those, those uh, plants and stuff around there, I mean, either had, that was part of their um, business or used hazardous chemicals in the process of manufacturing, and it sat there. Or it just seeped into the ground through usage. And then, um, you know, in, in, in the case of the MTAC and in other cases, they, they come in, remove all the soil, fill it back in, put a protective barrier over top of it, and then put another, you know, like a parking lot or something on top of it. Oh, yeah. Oh, really? I, can't, I always glowed when I went by there. I wondered what was going on. <laughs> I let my kids play over there. Isn't that near the, uh, what is it? Fifth Third Riverbank Run route? Yeah, yeah. There was a boat launch down there for years. Oh. It was, um, it's right on the river. Yeah. 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 Yeah.